Okay. Good evening, everyone. Um, so first off, I'd like to welcome you all and thank you all for coming to our first Inclusive Economy and Culture Scrutiny Panel. Um, so my name's Izzy. I'm the chair uh, of this panel um, and I'll introduce the panel members as they, as they come around. Um, just to quickly note um, that this meeting is open to the press and the public um, and is being recorded um, and will be broadcast on the Council's YouTube channel, from what I understand. Um, please ensure, therefore, you turn your microphone on uh, when you're speaking and turn it off when you're finished. Um, and all reports published as part of the agenda will be considered read by the panel um, and published reports will therefore be summarised by our guests. Um, and so I'll move on straight to apologies for absence. So I received apologies from Sandra Thomas um, and Roger Tester for lateness um, and Sam Littlewood for leaving early. Um, and Aidan Smith is also going to be a bit late, but he should be here any moment. Um, and Simon also is not going to be able to make it tonight, Simon Pierce. Uh, so that's any other apologies? I think that's everyone accounted for. So are we good? Right, um, and then we'll go on to um, any oh, urgent business. I've received no urgent business, so I'm going to assume there is none. Uh, and are there any declarations of interest from the panel members for anything on the agenda? Nope. All right, great. We'll move swiftly on um, to Jackie. If you're ready, um, it would be great to have an uh, update from you as the Cabinet Member for Inclusive Economy, Business, Skills and Greenwich Supports. Oh, no worries. Yeah, I, I want to apologize for myself. I've also got a bit of a cold, so I think there's something going around at the moment. So bear with us all. Thank you for inviting me. Um, can I just say that throughout my history, I prefer to do written reports. Um, so if when it's my turn to report again, if you request a written report, I find it much easier because people can read it before, uh, you know, they're perfectly able of understanding and um, it stops me having to talk to you for too long and that you can just ask me relevant questions. So. If that's okay, Chair, I'd prefer to do a written one in future. Yeah, that's absolutely no problem. We'll make sure to take that as a note so that any future yeah. reports can be written. Okay. So, um, my portfolio is pretty wide. Um, I'm assuming that the only bit that you want tonight, I mean, I can give you updates or another, but is about the business and economy, et cetera, et cetera, and not the anti-poverty stuff. Am I right with that? So, um, I think the main reason for this item was just for you to kind of give your priorities for the year. So, if that sort of aligns with what you'll be kind of focusing on, I know that you're, it's quite a big question to ask, but uh, we're happy. I know that we are going to have the um, anti poverty pre scrutiny item in, in October. In October. So, that's yeah. the next meeting. So, happy yeah. to hold yeah. that off because we'll, we'll hear yeah. a lot about that from in future. Yeah. So, happy for you to do the other bits. Look, I think the short answer is everything's the priority. You can't. <laughs> There's nothing you can say, well, we can't do that. We have to do everything on the list. So um, I'll, I'll, I'll run you through, and then I'm obviously happy to take questions, and Michelle uh, knows the detail far more than I do, so um, I'm sure she's happy to chip in if need be. So um, the broad portfolio in this bit of the portfolio is economic development, business, town centres and markets, GLAB, including all the employment programmes, and adult and community learning. So all of these sit within the Directorate of Regeneration, Enterprise and Skills. Um, but, you know, as I've already said, I've got responsibility for Greenwich Supports, which is with the Directorate of Finance. So it's, it's a different part of it. Um, so it focuses mainly on the missions in our Greenwich, which are namely um, Mission 11, which everyone has the opportunity for a secure, good job. Mission 12, town centres, high streets and shopping parades. Um, 
that are vibrant, prosperous, prosperous and well-maintained. Uh, mission 13 is that our economy attracts um, high new value businesses while strengthening its foundations. And mission 14, which is the voluntary community and socially motivated sectors in Greenwich are strengthened and able to provide more support to those most in need, which is a kind of bit of a shared thing across other people's um, portfolios. So, um, we agreed, if you remember, so let's start with economy and community wealth be building. We um, adopted the inclusive economy a strategy, which we agreed in March 2024, and it sets out the priorities for the service, which I believe you're having some of that tonight. Um, it sets out the clear priorities for how the council and partners will work together over the next 10 years, create a borough where everyone can reach their potential and where economic growth and wealth creates benefits for all. Um, there are three themes in that, people, place and prosperity. And uh, they're obviously all cross-cutting cross um, to tackle inequality and green growth. So building a more inclusive economy was vital to our missions. Uh, it's underpinned by the community wealth building strategy, which we adopted in 2022. Um, I chaired the Anchored in Greenwich group, where we are currently working with the Centre for Economic Studies to review the, the Anchored in Greenwich partnership and its approaches two years since its inception. The review will measure the impact on our collective work uh, and involve measuring the financial impact of the partnership in support of our shared priorities and to increase spend with the local SMEs. It will conclude with a review um, in December 24. Uh, in addition to that, we are driving inclusive labour market practices. For example, the Living Wage subgroup works with the Living Wage Foundation and together with partners are drawn from the public, private and voluntary sector. And we're delivering against an action plan to increase the number of wage accredited businesses in the borough. So over the coming year, as a group, we'll be advancing the work to become a living wage place. Having mapped low pay in the borough, we'll be keen to focus on actions that support improved pay and conditions across key sectors such as retail and hospitality. And there are additional subgroups fo focused on social value and climate change. Um, town centres. I, I don't know if you want me to stop at any point or just plough through. I'm happy to do with whichever you want. Just go for it. Okay. <laughs> okay. It feels like I'm reading a bedtime story. Um, so as South Emission 12 of our Greenwich plan, we want our town centres, high streets and shopping parades to be vibrant, prosperous, well-maintained places that meet the needs of local people. I'm working with officers to review the council approach to the management and maintenance of our three town centres, which are going to be challenging. Um, you know, we've all looked at budget stuff and we know that we've got less money in the system rather than more money. So, you know, particularly I mean, all the town centres are equal, but given that we're spending 20 million plus on Woolwich Town Centre, we need to make sure that we can maintain that and it, and it doesn't quickly deteriorate. Um, we've got a cross-cutting internal integrated town centre management and maintenance group. Uh, Officers of reviews town centre partnerships, of which there are many, and I will oversee the new or improved arrangements working more closely with businesses and other key stakeholders such as landholders to take a more active part. Um, the council secured UK shared prosperity funding and three areas have been identified for public realm and accessibility improvements and their Cuttisart Gardens are not close in Thamesmead and Leslie Smith Square which is Will you come on ward still, I think? I think it is, yeah. Um, I can never remember where the boundaries are. Um, and these improvements will focus on ensuring areas are welcoming, 
inclusive and increased daytime footfall, as well as football and football, <laughs> footfall and spend, we might have football, who knows, <laughs> and spend after 6 p.m. Um, in January, we will receive an update from the council and partners on the delivery of the nighttime economy enterprise zone, of which Woolwich Lakes was a pilot, receiving funding from the Mayor of London. It's been fully, re fully evaluated uh, and builds on the nighttime strategy, which we published in 2022. Um, it will set up the progress on our nighttime economy over the last two years and working with cabinet colleagues i'll bring it forward to a borough-wide uh, strategy meeting in 2025 um, and i'm just going to say look folks <laughs> we say the words nighttime economy it's heard differently by different people um, you know we we are not talking about putting nightclubs in town centers we're not talking about four in the mor morning venues unless they're in appropriate places we're actually talking about, um, you know, those of you that know Woolwich know that it's not particularly vibrant after seven, eight o'clock in the evening, a lot of coffee shops and, and um, cafes close down. We, we want people to stay and linger. So we're, we're trying to increase the, you know, up to midnight economy initially, quite frankly, um, because we are, as you will hear from sort of other colleagues in the future, um, in Woolwich expecting a whole different demographic over the next five to ten years with a lot of planning applications kind of in, in progress that bring in co-living spaces, student accommodation, um, you know, lots of things that will attract younger skin, single people and we need to make sure that we've got stuff for them to do rather than them all gun jump on the Lizzie line and go into Tottenham Court Road, which is very tempting, I know, because I do it quite often. Um, so we are working with businesses. The business support team is essential to help business develop. There's a number of business support programmes in place until March 2025, which support every stage of business development, as well as an increase in volunteering opportunities. Uh, with an outreach programme to support households take up energy efficient manager, measures to tackle rising energy activities and tackle the cost of living crisis. Um, we have quarterly business breakfasts, which I chair. Uh, the first one was in May, which I didn't chair because it wasn't in place. Um, but we had a, over 130 businesses attend. Um, and we're able to find out about local, regional and pan-London business support on offer to Greenwich businesses. The next one will be a Meet the Buyer event, which will focus on doing business in Greenwich. And we're, we're yet to set a date for that, because um, it's a bit tricky with all the works being done in the town hall. But we're hoping to get that done before December or during December. And that will be with our anchor partners and the Greenwich procurement team. The Business Awards, um, we are going to be doing the seventh um, Business Awards with nominations currently open. I think you all got an email for me to um, see what you had in your area and maybe think about nominating. Um, it will be in February sometime and it, it will be um, funded, supported by business, not ourselves. So. Um, we usually put on a good event and it's an opportunity to shine a spotlight on, on the amazing businesses that we do have, the borough, until, until you kind of look at those awards and look what's going on. You don't quite get how exciting a place it is to do business um, and, and it's always very good to be involved in those. Um, a good few years ago before COVID, my, my son and my my granddaughter's husband actually won it for their um, Eltham place. So, um, and it was a fair competition, I will say. But um, they are exciting. Um, we've got a strong track record in recruiting, um, in securing external funding to enable us to deliver employment and skills. Through GLAB and the adult and community learning over the next 12 months, we will continue to deliver both the national and devolved employment and skills programs so that we can bring people into the job market and into sustainable work. 
The new government has made its new deal for working people a core priority, and therefore we expect there to be some significant policy shifts um, that we're not quite sure what they're going to be. There are kind of rumours that um, local authorities may be required to uh, look at whether they want to deliver some of the current DWP um, functions, which we will clearly look at. Um, and, and it could be good opportunities to join up some of our anti-poverty work that, that I, th I think we have um, shining examples of and probably are one of the best in London in delivering that, although I'm not taking the credit for it because I've only just taken it over. Um, so we are looking at making sure, as I said earlier, delivering a genuine living wage, improvements in terms and conditions and the banning of exploitative zero-hour contracts. So these strongly align to Mission 11, uh, that everyone has the opportunity to secure a good job and remove all the barriers to work, etc. Um, we will be focusing on opportunities for individuals living in deprived areas and households in greatest need, such as those where no one's in work or where children are living in poverty to support social mobility and raise living standards. We've been talking about um, trying to um, be more in sync with people moving into temporary accommodation and making sure that um, those people have all had the opportunity to have assessments about work if they wish to, because we know that a lot of those people coming through to homeless accommodation are, are single parents or families where nobody works. So it, it's an opportunity to, to deal with that. Uh, so in October, um, we'll receive a summary on the council's approach to supporting young people in education. This panel's looking at that. Uh, and this will be a particular focus on how we encourage and support SMEs to employ local, local young people um, through programmes such as Greenwich Access to the Apprenticeship Fund, where we're supporting local employers to access our unspent levy fund and creating more apprenticeship opportunities for residents in key sectors, such as cold childcare, early years, construction and customer service. Saw a list the other day where there are quite a few um, childcare settings that are, are, are now doing level three apprenticeships for people with the fund. And, and it's a, a hugely growing sector that it, it needs people to be in it. Adult skills. So um, I'm pleased to announce, if you don't know already, that we are inspected in, um, Ofsted inspected in May and we achieved the provision of good across all areas. Um, Greenwich Learns offers about 500 part-time courses a year to more than 3,000 learners, ranging from courses to help people find work starting a business, improving digital skills and health uh, and well-being, as well as courses for personal development, like photography and, and cooking. Um, the event that we held was a, a, a wonderful event and, you know, we had awards for uh, Learner of the Year, awards for um, Tutor of the Year and the, the, the real feeling that people actually were so, so mm, pleased and, and grateful for what opportunities they'd been in viewed and there were some real, like, life-changing personal stories that, couldn't help, that you couldn't help to be moved by them. Um, the online survey conducted during the inspection revealed that 97% of learners would recommend the course to a friend, and 97% of staff said they're proud of the work of the service. Inspectors highlighted the safe and inclusive learning uh, environments at accessible venues, and there are courses for people with learning disabilities. Um, the expertise that the tutors praise leaders and managers for their focus on promoting equality and opportunity. Um, and as I said, that, that event was inspiring. So we're now at the new start of the new academic year and together with nine adult skills delivery partners, we'll be supporting over 3,000 learners again this year. And this will be also the final year of our existing skills framework 
So we will be preparing a new four-year framework that starts where this one finishes. Um, we'll also be refreshing and producing a four-year skills plan, uh, which will tie into that on meeting the skills needs of local residents and employers and work to feed this into the priority actions um, to develop a post-16 skills strategy and develop clear employment and skills progression pathways and retain local talent out of our local FE and HE institutions. So finally, in relation to skills, I'm pleased to report that the council secured, secured a DFE funding to establish the borough's first greener Greenwich Learning Lab in our Greenwich Park and community site. The new training space will equip individuals with green industry retrofit skills in construction. It houses six green learning booths. Um, I now am saying things that I'm not pretending to understand, um, in, including air source help, heat pump, heat pumps, <laughs> heat pumps yeah. <laughs> heat, yeah. <laughs> solar thermal, solar PV. I don't know what the difference between those are, but they will. Um, battery and electrical vehicle charging. The facility, facility will formally open in the autumn with the first cohort of learners targeted to the neat young people and care leavers. So, in summing up, um, you know, since I came into post at the end of May, we've done a lot. There's far more to do. Uh, there are challenges. Um, clearly, like every department in the council is having challenges to do more things with less money. Um, and I can't say that we're going to overcome all those obstacles, but um, I think we have to be optimistic that the economy will grow and that with that will come growth and with that will will help us to be able to deliver um, quality services to our residents. But actually, people being in, um, you know, properly paid secure jobs is, is the key to all of that, really. And, and we, that's what we are attempting to do. Okay. Great. Thank you so much, Jackie. Um, thank you for the yeah, overview on some of the work that you've been doing since you started. I appreciate you are new to the post. Um, and as you said, you have got a very large portfolio. Um, so anyone have any questions for Jackie? Councillor Smith? Yes, Rosa. Thank you, Jackie, for providing that. Um, delivered very beautifully, even though you say you don't like verbal reports, but yes, very uh, nicely done, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Um, you've said that one of the priorities is local jobs, obviously. So could you explain how you are ensuring that the businesses are generating local jobs as opposed to other types of jobs or jobs to, to people elsewhere? Are we adding a condition, for example, or providing encouragement or incentives for them to recruit locally? Better than I can, but we can't force them. We encourage, and, and GLAB does do the recruitment for a lot of the businesses, so therefore those jobs go to local people first because they're recruited through GLAB. But I'll let Michelle tell you in more detail. Thank you, Councillor Smith, and thank you for the question. I mean, I think that is essentially what, what we aim to do. So obviously, with the service Greenwich Local Labour and Business, the focus primarily when that was set up was about making sure local people were able to benefit from regeneration jobs being created in the borough. And that still continues to be a core kind of remit. So that's very much stipulated in uh, Section 106 agreements. Um, and that obviously then puts conditions on, on developers to, to work with GLAB to source those local businesses, to, sorry, source local people. Um, and I guess, you know, where you've got, for example, I'll use the O2 as an example, you've got an operator, you've got a developer, so they, you know, develop the O2 and they're also an operator, they're here for the long, long haul. So those relationships that we foster are, are ongoing and that's partly a bit of our strategic um, account management approach um, and then obviously there are sort of lots of employment programs that we deliver through GLAB and it's important obviously all of those programs uh, and a lot of them are performance related pay um, and you get paid on the, your ability to support people into, into jobs and sustainable jobs 
So, of course, we do a lot with, uh, you know, local, again, local employment accounts to make sure we can work with local employers. And then we touched on, very briefly, the Greenwich Access to Apprenticeship Fund. So that's another example how the council is using its unspent levy to encourage local businesses um, to use our unspent levy to take on apprenticeships. It does mean they can train existing work workforce, but we also require them to take on new apprenticeships, which are um, local, local residents, local to Greenwich. So a lot of our programmes are then tied into to Greenwich residents. That, that's great. Thank you. It sounds like you're doing quite a lot in this area, which is, which is good to understand. The other example that I wanted to just provide was that Greenwich obviously has a lot of sites that attract films um, and film uh, making, and I just wondered whether we're using that to create local jobs, for example. Yeah, I mean, it, it's a really good question. Um, and we, I mean, there is this, the film unit. I mean, a lot of, we, we had in the past developed schemes, <coughs> excuse me, where, you, where there's a requirement for extras. Um, so we did actually have a bank of, um, bank of staff that, you know, that were able to respond to those. Often those are very short-lived opportunities. Obviously what we're talking about is moving people into secure jobs that are sustainable, um, and they're generally quite short uh, opportunities, but we have responded to those things in the past, but we haven't got anything currently that I can think of. Can I? Yeah. Um, I think it's difficult, Roshan, because um, if you... I've lived in Woolwich a long time, and, and we had an end of Power Street co-op building, and we had a film site there that was... The bill. No, it was um, it, it, it was a film that was like a <laughs> a, a, a post um, Holocaust destruction type thing. It it looked lovely. It was like Woolwich was destroyed, but it was there for months. Um, I think it was called Children of Men or something like that. Um, Clive Owen, who I saw down there, it was a long time ago. Um, I do tend to remember quite nice looking men. Um, but um, film crews usually come and use our buildings and our sites, and I know that you get them a lot in um, the, the, the Naval College grounds and whatever. Um, the amount of days they're there and the amount of filmings they do, and then when you actually watch the film, it's like a 30-second bit of the film because it's all cut <coughs> down and edited, and you know the Bridgerton stuff, they're there for ages, and, and it's this much. They tend to bring, because it's, it's part of a much bigger production that is filmed all over the place, they bring their own technical, technical crews, actors, blah, blah, blah. But they do sometimes ask for extra, extras. And if you see the, um, I think it's still on, because it's about October is the actual 50th anniversary of McDonald's in Woolwich, I think, um, which was the first one in the UK. Uh, I remember it well. Um, I don't, I don't remember it at all. I wasn't even born then. Um, <laughs> there was a lot of filming going on and the one that they made look like the old McDonald's, I'm not gonna sing that song, um, is, is um, the Star Burger in Hare Street. So they kind of totally revamped that and did it and they were filming for like four or five days there. And what you see on the advert is 30 seconds max, but they did use some local people and, and children involved in, you know, being inside <laughs> there and whatever. But I suppose what I'm saying is the opportunities are quite limited, but, um, you know, the money comes into the council because we do charge them for filming and, and you know, culture and communities do that. And it, it might be a question that you ask for, um, for them when they come to report um, how much money we make from filming, et cetera. But you know, I know we do charge fees, and when when um, you know we, we, we require the the um, who, whatever company it is that's doing the filming to make contact with local residents and let them know what's going on and if there's any problems, who to contact and whatever. Thanks, but, Jackie. Said, sometimes they do it for days, and you get 30 seconds yeah. in a in a film or an advert. Great. So I'm quite conscious of time. Did you have? Yeah, I've got. Yeah, no, great. Thank you, Jackie. Um, just 
an another question. You mentioned the uh, business breakfast sessions that you do, that you've restarted. Um, can I just ask if these are borough-wide or if you're also going to be holding them more locally? Because we're trying in, within our wards to get more engagement with businesses. So any kind of support you can provide with, with this would be great. Wherever you are, they come. I mean, I'll get Michelle to check the list of the last one, but, you know, people do come. The, the problem is, Roshan, is getting a venue. Um, and um, if we do it anywhere other than the town hall, we have to pay for it. And, and the budget then gets, you know, we, unless somebody offers us a, a, um, a venue for free to come and have a business breakfast, which if you know anyone that, that wants to offer, then of, of course we'll look at it. But actually paying sometimes quite substantial mm. sums to, to book a venue just eats our budget. Um, so but all of the breakfasts are borough-wide, are they, rather than doing, you're not doing any kind of individually more local, they're all borough-wide, okay. Yeah, no. they're, they're, I mean, at the moment, they're, they're sort of borough-wide, so there's going to be four, four a year, um, and I think the idea is that we will follow a theme that's relevant and of interest uh, to the business community. So the first one was about business support, but as, as um, Councillor Smith highlighted, it's pertinent that we maybe look at sort of doing business uh, with the borough and other anchor organisations, particularly in light of the new Procurement Act coming in, not in October, but now February, it's been delayed slightly. Um, but that requires local authorities to, to actually set out um, how they're removing barriers for SMEs being able to, to you know, contract with the council. And because we've got the Anchored in Greenwich partnership, um, we're actually going to turn that into a meet the buyer event so that other um, you know, anchor organisations, Peabody, the colleges, the universities will also come with their pipeline of procurement opportunities as well. So there'll be a bit of capacity building for those you know, those businesses, but they are open to all businesses in the borough. Um, but because we're trying to do things at scale, generally we use a centralised venue. It's, it's also not the only opportunity that businesses have to meet together. Uh, no, we do, if you, the question that you're asking is, if we, do we do smaller ones in local areas? The answer is no. Um, there are there are pros and cons to that, really. If, if you just did it in a locality, you you'd lose some of the breadth of what you need to do. But the, the Chamber of Commerce have regular events and they do work um, in different areas of the borough. Um, you know, on the, on the Bexley border, or, you know, sometimes they're in Bexley that our businesses that are that way go. At your end, um, Lewisham border, um, you know, they meet there as well. And, and we will always plug those invites to businesses so that they know where they are. Uh, just to follow on um, from that question, um, because that's also something that I was looking at in my ward um, about trying to get some of the local businesses together, just because I think it's quite helpful for local businesses to meet each other or kind of talk about the challenges that there might be in a specific area. And I understand the constraints um, that you're fighting, um, but it would be helpful if there is any support that maybe ward councillors could be offered um, to, to help them kind of, even if it's you coming along to some of these meetings that they they kind of help organise um, and when they're on a ward level they're obviously going to have less businesses so hopefully one of the businesses might be able to open up to host it for free, who knows. Um, but yeah, any support that could be offered to ward councillors to do that I think would be much appreciated. There are other things as well, you know, so um, for some areas I'm going to one next week I think, uh, there's the Eltham Town Centre Partnership, you know, they meet, they organise it themselves, um, officers of the council attend. Um, you know, there are similar things in others. So if you want to generate stuff in your wards, that's absolutely fine. Um, we can't send hordes of officers because officers will never be getting on with any work. But, you know, if I can attend, I, I, I will. Um, you know, it just depends where and when they are and how they fit in with everything else. But anything you want to suggest, of course, we'll look at it. Yeah. Perfect. And even if there is a successful partnership working in Elton Town Centre, sharing how that works, maybe some of the agendas so that we can sort of mirror that in some of our local areas would be helpful. I mean, Any I other? think, sorry, I just gone. wanted to add to that. The, I mean, I know that, you know, you've been involved, Michelle, with us trying to get businesses together within our local area. And the challenge, I mean, the reason we want to do that is because we want 
businesses to feel a responsibility for the community and to be engaged with communities so that, you know, we see that in our ward at least, residents and businesses live very close together and so it can create tension if they don't understand each other and understand how they operate and feel a responsibility for the local area together. So, but obviously we don't have all of the resources, the knowledge or the understanding to create that effectively within our wards. So even if it's like a, a training or resource pack or something that you can provide that can help us at the ward level to bring this about better. Um, I think that's what I'm saying. We've, we've struggled at the ward level to create um, this harmonious environment between businesses and residents. So I think just to focus on that um, you, and to help local areas, local ward members kind of do that would be good. We have got traders forums and that might not be exactly what you want. But if you could email me, myself and Michelle to say exactly what it is that you would find helpful, it may well be, and, and I'm, I'm not kind of dismissing things, that on a award level, it's too much. But maybe three wards together or, or you know, a, a slightly bigger area might, might work. And we just have to kind of look at what's in that. But if you let us know what you think would be helpful, then we'll tell you honestly whether it's possible or not. Yeah? I think Michelle's aware. She's yeah. worked closely with us where we've tried to get this going and it's not really worked or taken off, but I can uh, follow up. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. Any other questions? Great, well, thank you very much, uh, Councillor Smith, for your update. And I don't know if you're hanging around for some of the next items. Can I just make a request? Yes. Um, I've got until 7.30 and then I've got a leg it to a ward meeting and I know Sam needs to be swift behind me because we've got a lot of difficult things uh, tonight to deal with. Um, can I just ask um, that you change the order of the, the five and six because actually six is the, is the high level strategy, five comes below it. So if you change the order, it'll make a lot more sense. It'll, yeah. uh, it'll it, stop you reading the end of the book before the beginning. Yeah, I'm happy with that if everyone else is happy. And if you're happy to stay a little longer, the people at the back. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. All right, so we'll go ahead to the uh, item, which is the strategy kind of plan for the next year ahead, I guess. I'll hand over to you, Michelle, and Councillor Smith yes. and Pippa. So I'm just going to introduce the item just really very briefly because, um, Chair, I'm, I'm hopeful that you've, you've obviously seen and I know you've read the report. Um, so we want to allow time for questions. So I think really by way of a short update, um, obviously it focuses on the work that we are setting out via our inclusive economy strategy, as we said, it was agreed in March this year. Um, the report itself covers sort of six of the 20 missions that were set out in the Al Greenwich Plan so, and quite helpfully set around a framework with those pillars, people, place and prosperity and the cross-cutting themes we've touched on, tackling inequality and driving sustainable growth. Um, I think the, the report also seeks to provide an update on this work, which obviously March and we're in <laughs> sort of September, so uh, we are hitting the ground running, um, with a, but we want to obviously focus particularly on sort of year one in terms of our delivery plan um, and actually provide some thoughts and reflections in terms of potential barriers for delivery um, and so my colleagues and I um, behind me and myself were happy to take questions thank you okay great um, just to help everyone that might not have found it is page 65 um, is the kind of this paper that we're on now um, so I I guess I can start when everyone figures their way through where we're at, um, and I'll just switch. Um, do, do, do. Yeah, I guess, I guess to give a bit of context, um, one of the things that kind of I felt is becoming a councillor, and fairly or unfairly, it's probably unfairly, is that I've engaged with a lot of setting of strategies and actually not really heard very much when they, you know, the, in the actual delivery and following up on them. And I'm quite keen, um, particularly as this panel has the culture strategy, the, um, this strategy, and as well as the anti-poverty strategy to not just launch them, but also see how we're kind of meeting some of the objectives outlined in them. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm grateful that you could talk, talk through what you're looking to do in this first year, and it would be helpful to bring this back in a year to see how well you've managed to achieve some of the metrics that you've um, laid out for us. Um, 
I guess when you're talking about kind of resourcing and capacity, which is, I think, one of the barriers, you sort of said that mm, some of the potential barriers may include in, like, lack of staffing, potentially, and funding. Um, how might you kind of mitigate some of those challenges, um, especially for some of these initiatives that you want to do in the first year where you're still trying to build, I guess, the team around the strategy? Um, and where you've talked about buy-in uh, across the council, what steps are you taking to achieve that buy-in? And I guess, is there anything that you need from us as panel members of the, of the Inclusive Economy and Culture Draft panel um, and as councillors to help with that buy-in across, across the council and, I guess, to residents? Hope some of those questions start. Um, thank you, Chair. I mean, I mean there, it's a really good question. I think that what we've tried to do focus in terms of year one is on things that we uh, you kind of naturally working on. I think it's fair to say that the, as, as you know, the inclusive economy strategy is a, a significant body of work that's taken a number of years to get to where it's got to. Um, not least because we've had Brexit, we've had COVID, you know, um, austerity and all of those things where, where we want to then it's about the you know, how we support the recovery of the economy, etc. So we've needed to kind of look at that th at different times through different lenses. But despite that, clearly there is lots of work that we're doing as a directorate and as a, as a department to ensure that we are working to create the conditions in which, um, you, you know, the economy can thrive. So there's always been those programmes around GLAB. We've always delivered... Um, uh, adult and community learning programs and so what we've done in terms of mitigation is try to work uh, um, where we've got a, a, a head of steam if you like and where we can uh, identify and align existing funding streams some of those funding streams are time limited so um, we've touched on briefly about UK shared prosperity funding uh, which was three years funding which is uh, needs to be spent by March next year uh, we've got a report coming to this panel that sets out what we've achieved there. So, you know, that, those objectives and, and the way we've aligned that funding, funding will help us deliver on some of those priorities. I think in terms of um, capacity and staffing, yeah, clearly that's always going to be a challenge. Um, particularly as a department, we are wholly reliant pretty much on external funding, which we've had a strong track record of doing so to date, but, you know, um, there's always uncertainty with, with time-limited funding. So we are hopeful that possibly with multi-year settlements, it makes our job a bit easier because we have a little bit more certainty than just at the moment having to bid for, compete for lots of discrete pots of funding, um, which takes a lot of time and effort. Um, and if we could, um, you know, maybe there's a bit more devolution and there's a bit more multi-year settlements, then we can plan over a longer period of time. And I think, you know, the buy-in essentially is coming through our anchor partners. I think we can't underestimate the power of our anchor organisations in the borough and the buy-in that we have. Um, you know, we have got a large, um, you know, public sector economy which has its own challenges and presents opportunities. And I think one of those opportunities is collectively we can do more at scale and with more impact by harnessing our collective power. So we're about to refresh the workers, councillor, Smith has outlined and so part of that refresh will look at our priorities for the next two to three years with those anchor organisations and with that in mind we will seek to sort of align that again with some of the delivery that we want to do year one um, um, and beyond. Great and I did actually see somewhere in the report that there's um, going to be an evaluation of the uh, at some point this year. It would be quite helpful to have that come back to the to the panel if there's time. I, I know that we haven't got loads in the March meeting, so maybe that gives you a bit of time to look through the evaluation and then we can kind of see how you've, I don't know, maybe something to look at. Um, any other questions or? Yeah, Tom. Thank you, I've, I've got a couple of questions. So, um, and sorry, this, this might sprawl over to the um, high value business bit as well, but so looking at kind of job and business density, looking at productivity, looking at GVA, it seems that Greenwich sometimes underperforms other boroughs and, and sometimes nationally. Um, I think there's an explanation somewhere about this being caused by population um, growth. But is there more to it than that? Because population growth shouldn't matter if you're replacing those industries, those sort of economic sectors with highly productive areas. So why is it, do you think, that we're sort of slipping behind um, some of these other boroughs? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, it, you know, taking, um, and I'll get my colleagues to jump in as well, if necessary, but I think taking things like population growth, I think we can't underestimate the fact, I think we've got, is it the second highest population growth across London? Um, we've got the second highest, um, or we did have, I know that the housing targets have been revised, um, but we did have certainly the second highest housing target. So those... That housing development is coming forward at a fast, you know, a faster pace, and we are, you know, our, as I say, our populations are is growing. Unfortunately, you know, that's happened against the backdrop of a, a, a static business base. So when you net it off and you look at a business startup and business survival rates after sort of, you know, three and five years, they don't perform as well as the London averages for probably for various reasons. Some of that could be viewed positively that you fail quickly. <laughs> you know, rather than stringing along a business that is, is not really viable. So I genuinely do think that that is a factor, um, although it can't simply be about that. I think we also have to be mindful, obviously, you know, we have the opportunity areas in the borough, um, and there are areas we know identified in the London plan, which could be significant um, housing and employment growth. Um, some of those activities... Uh, might displace some of the existing businesses. So again, we need to be mindful that we retain what we have, safeguard uh, jobs, um, and some allied work to that is about business relocation. Um, but it's also about you know planning policy and all the things that we're doing currently. When I say we, it's not not this directorate, but um, regeneration and um, other directorates are, um, departments are doing on that. It's really important we get the balance right, but I think you know things are happening at different paces. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, and then one thought as well. So it's, a, it's called the inclusive economy strategy. Sometimes the best way to grow is to, is to specialise. So the you know, City of London does financial services, Oxford does research, Southampton does maritime industry, that that kind of thing. So yes, we have to be inclusive, but are we also going to be brave enough to say these are the industries we really want to specialise in because Greenwich has that edge? And I, and I noticed as well that we mentioned two electrical companies as well as two of our largest employers, AEG and is it Al Alcatel or somebody. Um, so you know, being brave enough, I think, could, could be quite a spur for future growth. No, I think I think that's absolutely right. I mean, we I mean, it's I think the, the, some of the challenges with that, and we you know, is you do have to pick pick the you know, pick some sectors that you want to focus on. And certainly one of the pieces of work that we're doing that we'll touch on, as you say, in the attracting high value businesses is actually taking some of this evidence base that we've done through the, in, you know, develop, developing the strategy to look at those uh, sectors where we have an advantage, a competitive edge, whether it's a locational advantage. One of the things is that the borough is so different in different parts of the borough. You know, you've got the maritime Greenwich, so clearly... You know, a strength is the visitor economy and the maritime assets that we have. Um, but then you, you know, you look at, say, Woolwich. Obviously, we've got a, a growing sort of um, cultural sector there as well, uh, potentially with you know good opportunity for growth of office, um, office professional services jobs potentially. Um, Charlton Riverside currently is a bit mixed, but again, it's got quite a creative focus as well. So I think it is about us identifying those sectors and saying these are the three or four that we are going to, you know, kind of going to pursue. And, and part of the work that we, we've commissioned will help us do that. So we'll have a bit of a technical assessment of each of those sectors because we always want them to be high value, which means that we don't want more of the same, um, sometimes low producti productivity jobs because we've got an overshare of, say, retail, which perhaps doesn't always pay well. Um, so we do want to, you know, jobs that are going to be paying um, people a real living wage that's going to lift people out of poverty, that's going to improve li living standards. So, you know, we need a fine balance, really. Uh, just to follow on, on that, and then I'll come bring um, Councillor Smith in. Um, I think you've also talked about um, connecting this with our ambition um, around kind of green growth. And I wonder how much you I know you spoke a little bit about in your earlier opening kind of item, but... Is there much work going on to making green growth part of our kind of strategic focus, um, uh, particularly as it is a growth area, and how much money is going to be hopefully pummeled into that industry over the coming years? Yeah, and I think that's why we've got a cross-cutting theme that's green economy, because in, re in reality, all jobs need to, to green a little bit. So it's, it depends if you want to look at pure different definition of what a green job is or whether it's about every job 
and every sector happen to think about their footprint, carbon footprint, thinking about how they decarbonise. So I think it, it's all of that, but I think we, we want to make sure, you know, if we, for example, you know, we do have a lot of logistic uh, companies in the borough, um, and obviously that has challenges around air pollution, but we need to understand how that sector is decarbonising. We know, for example, uh, Uber bike, boats by Thames Clipper have piloted a few sort of, um, um, what are they? <laughs> I can't remember what they're called. Um, zero emission sort of um, fleet, basically, um, hybrid fleet. So, I mean, there's, there are ways in which things can be done uh, in a more sustainable way. Um, and I think... Um, there's quite a lot of work that's been done. Um, we're part of a sub-region, local London, and there is a, a particular sort of um, aspect of that work that's focused on green, green in the economy, um, in particular looking at various sort of sectors, whether it's finance, whether it's retrofit, which we do have a competitive advantage, I think, in construction retrofit, which is where we're going. We've got uh, London South East Colleges, um, who chair that work uh, across the sub-region. Um, and we've got, obviously, a lot of heritage assets that uh, also we need to think about, you know, how do we make those more sustainable as well going forward, which is was quite challenging. So I think, hopefully, the work will help us to distill where our, what part of green we can focus on, but also be thinking about all the sectors that need to decarbonise in a different way. I don't know if any colleagues want to add anything to that, because I might have missed... Yeah, okay, thank you. So, so I think um, it's likely that construction will be one of our sector strengths and one that we'll want to continue. And construction is an area that's transforming rapidly. So obviously with um, what Councillor Smith said about what's happening with through LSEC, that's critical. And we will need to find more ways to expand on that curriculum because otherwise we won't be able to supply the labour the skilled labour to our developers and landowners in the borough. So, so that will be an, an area of opportunity that I think is sort of almost a foregone conclusion in terms of something that we need to focus on. I think the other thing is, um, in terms of your earlier question, Councillor Littlewood, um, for example, when we're talking to Alcatel, we're also talking to them about their supply chain. What do they need in order to continue to um, exist within the borough but also expand within the borough and seeing whether Charlton Riverside might offer an opportunity for us to secure some businesses that can feed their supply chain without having to have those transport movements so that we're sort of if you like developing a critical support group of businesses around key businesses that are high value in the borough. Thank you very much uh, Councillor Smith. Thank you. Um, working from home uh, only has a sort of brief mention in the evidence base, but considering it was 2023, so it's kind of unknown, um, but that sort of seems to have been sticking out. I mean, it says that 54% of our residents actually work from home, which seems like quite a lot. Um, and we've also had the uh, Elizabeth Line stations open in Abbey Wood and Woolwich. I wondered whether there is already any indication as to what effect both of those factors are having on the local economy. Yeah, it was really, a really good question. I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, the sort of work patterns have clearly changed and are here to probably to stay for the foreseeable. I think, but people are travelling in, you know, spending probably at least two to three days in, in the office. So that, that seems to be where it's plateaued. I think that's pretty much um, a sort of a, a London-wide picture. It's interesting, I mean, I'm not transport, but, I, you know, when you look at the transport figures, we see that, you know, um, passenger travel is, is back up to pre-pandemic levels. So clearly people are still using um, those transport links. I think maybe they're more inclined, if they are working for home, to probably travel to go somewhere, you know, in order to have an evening out. Uh, which is one of the reasons why we want to make our borough attractive in terms of a nighttime economy, that people don't have to travel into central London, that there are things that people can do here that are affordable and enjoyable uh, as well. So I think, um, I think it hasn't borne out, you know, we, we could look at the detail if you want more of a technical sort of um, response, we could see what the figures look like. But I think, you know, as I say, from the TfL and transport 
figures, things are back up um, to where they were. I, th I think, yeah, there are a lot of people working from home. We know that. And, and the key to making sure that that works properly is in the new developments that, that we make sure we've got um, high-speed broadband. Um, um, Councillor Littlewood and myself had a presentation from the people that are doing McBean Street, um, which I have to say seems incredibly well thought out. But one of the things that, you know, I was quite gobsmacked to, to appreciate was they are they're doing student accommodation as well as um, single dwellings and co-living. So it's, it's quite a mixture. But as part of what they're doing, they're putting in a podcast room that can be used by, you know, the people that live there um, in order to do that if that's what they do. And, you know, it'll be bookable and they'll be able to do it. So it'll be kitted out specifically to do podcasts. And I think those are the conversations we need to have with developers, particularly those that are coming to... Um, presents with a lot of co-living or student accommodation that okay what exactly are the facilities you're putting in and are you making that fit for the 21st century because if uh, in my house don't get me going if two of us are on a on a, a zoom or a teams call at the same time forget it it doesn't work we can't and we can't get it in our house we can't get fiber broadband um, so we've, we've got to really, with vengeance, get these services put in for people because you can't work from home unless you've got the means to do it and, and actually high-speed fibre broadband is essential to doing that, you know, plus whatever facilities people are doing in places with shared spaces. It's essential to, to help us grow the economy as well that those facilities are in that development from the beginning. So, um, sort of related to that, because we've got the Elizabeth line now and, and it does help people commute into central London, it also helps people commute from central London and Reading if they want to, to, to come to Abbey Wood. So I wondered whether um, or what plans there are to engage with local landowners of, you know, like industrial estates and things in Woolwich and Abbey Wood, you know, because we have an opportunity to perhaps poach some businesses based in Westminster, and I hope no one's watching, I'm sure they're not. But, you know, but, but some, some sort of central London office space that would actually be cheaper. And I, I remember we, we built some uh, office units on an industrial estate in Abbey Wood, and I think they were snapped up immediately. So, it, again, I wonder what... Uh, what plans there are to engage local landowners and encourage them to put in workspace? Um, so in terms of uh, attracting from outside of the borough, um, you may recall that we use agents and sometimes we use, we might appoint two agents in our own, because obviously we're quite a big landowner ourselves of commercial property. And so we'll typically use a local agent as well as an agent that has a more national or regional presence so as a means to try and attract the, the best opportunities for um, external organisations to come into the borough. Um, in terms of creating the space and encouraging other businesses and landowners to do that, uh, we do do that, but I think um, a lot of developers already have in their mind's eye who they want, and then they will do sweet deals, if you like, in order to attract uh, organizations into the borough that they want that fits with their brand and profile if you like of the developments and the schemes that they're bringing forward so it's harder to influence and there's a balance to be struck isn't there between um, for us I think as a borough where we want local businesses to be able to expand and take space and whether other la private landowners are prepared to take the risk sometimes with that alongside taking the, the big names and the brands and there's, so there's that balance. Yeah, uh, Councillor Hannan. Great, thank you. Um, so I think there's a common kind of theme that's emerging from the comments that Councillor Littlewood and Councillor Smith have been saying which is that we need to be more proactive in with businesses and attracting them and setting the agenda for what we want in our borough rather than um, 
being more complacent. I think what, what you have in the delivery plan is, is great. It's talking about how we can be more attractive as a borough to businesses. But I think what we're saying is that we also need a different approach where we are identifying sectors, and it's great to know that you're thinking about construction, and I know that we also have a sector study that's going to come out, which will hopefully help us to identify this, but we need a proactive approach with businesses to get them here, not just complacent or I guess, I don't know if that's the right word, but setting, it's right that we should make sure that we are attractive as a borough, but we also need to be out there drawing them in and pulling them in, identifying businesses that we want, making the case to bring them here, um, identifying sectors that we want, making the case to create that identity, if you like, within the borough, for that sector so that any developers that do come know this is our brand, this is what our borough is known for, this is what we are good at, and to almost direct how that goes. So I think we just have to be more proactive in setting that agenda. Yeah, I agree. We need to articulate what we want and our ask, definitely. Um, but we do, uh, just to assure you, I know you um, sort of reserve the, the word complacency. I don't think we are complacent, but we know we can do more. And uh, we do work with London and Partners and Opportunity London, who identify uh, multinational organisations as well as national organisations uh, that might be interested. And then they give us bulletins, which we can then follow up. So they broker the introduction, and then we try to pursue the ones that we think are a good fit for the borough, and there was a recently um, an organisation who Michelle will recall the name of, um, who has located into the borough as a result of that. So, so they are early beginnings in terms of that work, but we know that there's um, more to do, and that's about us prioritising the resources we've got to focus on things like local businesses and supporting them to survive and thrive alongside being creating the right conditions for others to be attracted to the borough. I think the other challenge is around space and what, what planning and developments actually create and the type of space that they create. So an example would be a lot of developments in the past have created basket supermarket store space. And that isn't necessarily what we're looking for. Obviously, there's a place for that, but we want something that's more variety than having basket supermarket stores on every ground floor. Um, and so it's about making sure that feeding through from the, um, now we've got the strategy, and then once we've got the sector study, making sure we're articulating the ask to a planning team to make sure that they are including it within the negotiation and they're very clear on what the ask is for the economy. My only one I think I haven't asked, which I sort of touched on earlier, is um, it, we talked about buy-in a little bit. So I was just interested, interested to know what kind of, I guess, either training or because inclusive economy, maybe not all businesses you know, know what that term is, inclusive economy. So, yeah, what training or communications do we have for both these big organisations, but also the SMEs, to, to get them bought in um, to, to the strategy and, and bring them into what we're trying to achieve here? And then what's that kind of comms plan? Yeah, I mean, we, we try to do a lot of work, obviously, not just during the consultation period, but we also set up some, some specific kind of uh, what do we call them, sort of workshops with across some particular sectors. So we try to invite um, businesses to come in, come in and talk to us about their sector, help shape the, you know, to help shape that, including, you know, individual one-to-one -one discussions with landowners and things like that. So I think, you know, that's really been important. I mean, it's a good point about inclusive economy and why, why, why an inclusive economy, what, what, what makes that different? I think what we are saying uh, when we're trying to articulate to not just businesses but to residents is that, um, you know, we have got significant planned um, employment growth in the borough, probably this, I think, the second highest across London, um, 28,000 additional jobs by 2051, um, which is about 32% growth in our current business base compared to a London average of 
Um, and we've seen growth to some extent, um, but actually what we haven't seen is those benefits being equally distrib distributed across um, society. So I think what we're trying to get across, uh, as I say, to businesses and local, uh, local residents is that we want to see everyone benefiting from wealth that's created in the borough. And so there is hence a, a, a focus, and we know it's not the answer to everything, but you know, this authority has cooperative values and community wealth building underpins, uh, has underpinned that work that we've done uh, to develop an inclusive strategy. And so we want to work with more cooperatives and social, socially minded businesses in the borough where they're more inclined to see that wealth retained without you know, necessarily all of that going out into uh, shares, <laughs> you know, um, shareholders profits outside of the, of the borough or equity funds, etc. In, term, in terms of buy-in, we're doing lots of work with our anchored in Greenwich partners. So we, we talk to them about what community wealth building me means, um, what they can do within their own organisations. So things around different approaches to employment practices, where we can actually look at some of our um, local people, local talent that we have, and make sure that local talent is coming through in those sorts of organisations, where our young people have opportunities, our young people who are neat, you know, they have those, those opportunities through our anchor institutions as well as our own organisation. We've also done a lot of work with um, organisations around procurement, procurement, social value, um, really looking at actually how can we have a consistent approach to looking at social value and procurement, um, how can we maximise benefits for the local community um, through social value and procurement. Things like living wage. So we've got um, a, a, a living wage subgroup, um, which is made up of a combination of public, private, and VCSE sectors. Um, and they're all sort of banging the drum to encourage local businesses to become not just living wage employers, but also um, good employers. Mm -hmm. So looking at good working practices. So there's lots of stuff that we've done around sort of building that capacity with um, local employers across a range of areas where we're asking our anchor institutions um, to actually spread that word. So it's not just about what we're doing, we're doing it through our other partner organisations too. Great, thank you very much. Oh yeah, Councillor Hannan. Sorry, I just have a couple more questions. Yeah. Um, so one of them is around cooperatives, and I'm really glad you, you mentioned that. Um, I know that nationally there's a priority to um, engage more with cooperatives and also within this borough but i was wondering what our approach is with businesses and cooperatives and whether we're proactively um, selling that idea if you like or showcasing how they work and how successful they can be in different areas is there a strategy or approach for that i know you're saying that that's the type of business you want but what is our approach to ensure we, we're getting those established um, and set up functioning. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a good good point. I think the thing is, they often people don't know what they don't know. So I think that's one of the things that, that we've identified. So an example of how we're aligning some of our existing funding to kind of help that deliver on the things we need it to deliver on. One of our adult and community learning uh, providers happens to be Greenwich Cooperative Development, GCDA. Um, and they deliver some business, um, business support um, provision under the uh, adult and community learning contract. Now, it's, it's, it's very much sort of focused on sort of businesses wanting to, you know, people want to start a business, but people don't often think about cooperative models, whether it could be a social enterprise, um, you know, whether it could be community interest company. Um, but with the, where they've got that expertise, they're able to provide that level of, you know, a level of, um, you know, insight, I guess, and, and knowledge to people that might want to consider, consider those routes. Also, with some of the UK SPF uh, funding, we've piloted some work with CNT Associates. Um, they're currently delivering a, um, a generative business support programme, again, particularly focused on not just those businesses that might think about a cooperative or a cooperative model, um, but also provide some um, micro micro funding. Is that the right word? <laughs> um, to help them to get those ideas off the ground. So it's all very small scale at the moment. And, and you're right in terms of, you know, there's a national drive now um, under the new government as well to redouble um, the number, the cooperative sector. 
Um, we do have a cooperative commission coming forward separately, which isn't one for tonight. <laughs> but, you know, hopefully, watch this space, there'll be more that we can say on that, hopefully, over time. I mean, I, th I think that we can probably also do, like, awards or some recognition for cooperatives, mutuals, or other social enterprises, and that would just generate more awareness. And we already have quite a few in the borough, so just to raise awareness that this isn't a new sector. This is already a vibrant sector, but how do we just get it going more? Um, raise awareness. <coughs> No, so, so I think I think that one of the outcomes or recommendations from the Cooperative Commission, which is independent to the council and Councillor Lolivar is the um, lead representative in terms of the council's administration. But it's very likely that the recommendations will um, talk about promotion and awareness raising within the council as much as externally because um, our colleagues across the council need to understand the opportunities that cooperatives bring and through the um, procurement process, and then also externally. And some of those recommendations will be about how we can support and grow the sector. And that might be not necessarily from cooperatives in the borough always, it might be from neighboring boroughs, but it's about in, you know, supporting the cooperative movement where we can. So those recommendations will come forward uh, later this year and cabinet will be considering those. So um, it just depends when the actual commission concludes. It's been slightly delayed because of the various pre-election periods, um, but uh, it will be coming. That's great, thank yeah. you. Sorry, I was just gonna say a final point. I've been reminded we are members of the Cooperative Council Innovation Network. Um, and one of the policy pieces that they've been doing and will be launched soon is a cooperative toolkit for councils. Um, and there'll be lots of training as well for that councillors and officers can get involved in as well. So that's, uh, that work is coming forward as well. So that hopefully will feed into all of our sort of commitment to increasing the, the number of cooperatives in the borough. That's great, thank you. Um, yeah, and just one more question around um, the delivery plan again, and uh, looking at whether there are priority locations for us to focus on business development. So I know that you know there are certain areas that we're looking at developing, and we have a lot of development going on, like Woolwich, for example. And we're talking also about universities um, and identifying and linking universities to businesses and skills. So do we have an approach where we're looking at universities in some of our priority development areas and having specific targets for businesses and development of businesses within those locations? I think, I mean, I've touched on sort of the opportunity areas, which obviously are areas in the borough, um, Greenwich Peninsula, Thamesmead, Charlton Riverside, um, Woolwich, um, I think are the one, main ones, uh, that, that are already identified where there's significant opportunity for increased housing uh, and, and will create the majority of jobs coming forward. I think, you know, obviously we do recognise we are fortunate to have uh, the number of universities that we do in the borough, and I think within the evidence base, um, there is, you know, some interesting sort of um, statistics in terms of those university spin-offs. So all of our universities have big business incubator space, so they're nurturing that sort of new talent coming through. But in addition to that, a lot of those, or quite a significant number, way above the sort of London averages, go on to set up other businesses and establish patent businesses. So there's obviously that intellectual sort of property coming out of those universities. To what extent, you know, we can retain some of that and maybe the move on space, it's, it's a bit of the business, the business space piece that we need to do to identify, um, you know, that we've got the right sort of space in the borough at the right stage of business. Because one of the things, you know, could be about move on space. You know, sometimes we can accommodate businesses that are growing, sometimes we can't. I mean, that's a problem across London. Um, you know, London is seen as a sort of national incubator, and as businesses get bigger, sometimes they move further east or out of the borough. So that is a challenge. Um, but there's a bit of work we're going to do to kind of map um, business space across the borough and also look at affordable workspace policies as well. 
Okay, thank you very much. I'm conscious of time, so uh, but I think some of my questions on the um, first item have been I've asked already, so because obviously they are very much interlinked. Um, so if we go back now to the high value business item, I don't know if you had an introduction to that one. Yeah. Yeah. Do you want to come over this? Yeah, I'm going to just introduce the item shortly if I can find my. <clears throat> I think you're right. We we sort of have touched on on some of those things. Um, I mean, this mainly sort of links to Mission 13 in the Al Greenwich strategy, which is as we've highlighted. You know, we want to set out this in our report, our approach, our emerging approach, if you like, to how do we how are we going to attract those high level high value businesses, um, but also while recognising that we want to strengthen the foundation and, and we have to accept that we do have a large uh, foundational economy sector, um, so those every time, everyday jobs. So it's about 26% at the moment um, and that compares to 16% nationally. So the thing about the foundational jobs, obviously they are jobs that people need to live everyday economy jobs is another way of describing them and, and you know like health and retail uh, and indeed construction you know a lot of these sectors have an aging workforce so you you are going to see a lot of replacement demand coming through so those jobs are really important and you know some of the work we're touching on is how do we make those jobs better paid you know because some of those are low value low productivity jobs um, so we've touched on already, I won't go and labour it anymore, you know, the fact that we've got a big public sector, but we see that as, as, a, as a strength as well, if we can harness it in the right way. Um, I touched on nine, uh, private sector employment is 9% um, percentage point lower than the national average. Um, so again, we want to see that GVA growth in high value uh, businesses. Part of that, as we've touched on, is about creating the conditions, uh, whether that's through our planning policy, regeneration frameworks, work that we do uh, sub-regionally and with London in terms of, you know, how do we position us uh, as a borough of choice in terms of relocation. All of those things are in the mix, really. Um, so I'm probably going to just stop there, really, because I think we've touched on some questions, so it would be good to, good to um, take questions on that. Yeah. Thank okay, you. perfect. Um, just um, let you know, uh, Councillor Lester, we've moved the agenda around a little bit, so we've just started the high value businesses agenda item. Um, Thank you. Uh, any initial questions from the floor? Yeah, Councillor Smith. Thank you, Chair. I think, uh, I guess my feeling on this is that we've kind of commissioned this report too early. Um, because like one of the things is about the, I mean, all the stuff about the high value businesses in section six of the report. And, um, and I think the sector, the sector plans are actually the most interesting part and would be the most valuable part, but you've only just commissioned it. Uh, so, so perhaps we might want to consider bringing something back later or in a year's time. Um, but I mean, but it's really interesting and uh, in terms of like the relocation, um, I would also like to see, as I, I said in the earlier item, things about encouraging businesses to re relocate from elsewhere in London to our borough, I think, uh, as well as, as looking at space. And also with the local plan, um, I think it's also important not just to look at affordable workspace, but also the density of workspace and mixed use developments um because we don't have very much land and we need to you know squeeze businesses into the space that we have probably going upwards i was only going to say i agree with councillor smith in terms it's probably a little bit premature um and we could work it into the when we bring you an update on the delivery of the strategy we could have a key section on the high value aspects so that we're responding to those points. Sorry. I know this is on the work programme of last year's, by the former panel, so it's, it's one that's been waiting, I think, for a while, but it's definitely one we can pick up um, uh, yeah, at a later date. Um, yeah, Councillor Hannah. Just a quick question. So are we saying that there are only two high value businesses in our borough, Alcatel and AEG? No? Okay. They were just two examples, but the appendix tells you who the um, high value business, top 20 by turnover and by staff. But we tried to give you a flavour of two key ones that we work with so that you understood that we're not 
not doing anything, but there's more that we can do. Okay. Um, I know that um, Councillor Littlewood touched on this earlier, but yeah, it was um, quite surprising to read some of the data about us being sort of 31 out of 32 um, in the kind of London boroughs um, around kind of business density and some of the other kind of stats that are in that section, evidence section. Um, and uh, you, you've accounted for that partly through, um, I think, yeah, and more people. Um, but yeah, I just was, is there any more comments on kind of some of the rationale behind, behind that? And um, I understand that obviously in comparison to some of the central London boroughs, I'm sure there's a, there's a big difference between, you know, zone, zone one and whatever zone we are here. So it'd be interesting to see some of the comparisons with our, some the people we usually compare ourselves to, some of the other outer London boroughs um, across the, across the, of London. Uh, yeah, so um, I think it's a fun a partly a function of the geography of the borough itself, given the nature of the green space and the residential nature of much of our much of our location here. So that, that has a, a huge bearing, obviously, in the density of businesses and employment, I think, generally, and not to mention the, the high employment growth that we've had recently. I think it would be interesting to do a bit of a comparison with our, with our inner London neighbours to see how they compare and why, and maybe get some explanation as to why that's the case, and if there's anything that we can do practically to, to, to change that, that trend or that direction in terms of that, the figures. I think it's also about the competing pressures when planning developments come forward. So there's the pressure for housing alongside the pressure for employment, and often housing trumps that. And so you potentially get less employment space than because of that pressure, and obviously we want affordable housing. But obviously, for us, we want to make sure that we're not just a, a residential borough or a dormitory, that we have places for businesses to locate and grow. So it's, um, Councillor Smith will recall many a conversation with developers where I will ask about what the developers are thinking about in terms of their employment offer, um, not just the housing. So, so I think that's something that we're trying to rebalance through the local plan to make sure that employment users get the, the merit and interest that they should alongside uh, obviously the obviously very acute need for housing. Thanks, that's really helpful, I think, context, and good to hear that it's something that the local planners, the new local planners thought up. Maybe when it comes back, we could have some of the comparison data with some of our normal comparators, the other out to London boroughs. Do you want to come back in on that? No? I, was, I was just going to say, sorry, that there's an, the employment land review, which forms part of the local plan. We've been jointly commissioned with our planning colleagues, so we're directly involved as part of this work in looking at the employment land review currently, which is underway, mm. part of the local plan process. Great, thank you very much. Sorry, Councillor. I think just, um, you know, in line with the type of businesses we want in the borough, we should also be thinking about the type of businesses we don't want in the borough because it doesn't align with our values or what we want to achieve. And we're seeing with some of the initiatives currently underway that we are at risk of becoming a big distribution hub um, and last mile delivery uh, places and a lot of the developers are also planning for that because they know that that's what is going to be attractive um, in terms of industrial units or business hubs that they have in their in their locations so I think we also need to be proactive before we get to that stage and think and have a plan for what we want and what we don't want and how we align those yeah and in fact um, that's a discussion that Michelle and I had only today um, about businesses that perhaps are um, less important because there will always be some that are less important than others. Um, what I'd say about things like um, distribution and logistics, it's not always within our gift to resist it because sometimes the use class um, of a particular location or site might mean that they can exist there um, without needing planning consent. So. There are things that we can do to try and shape what we want through the planning process, but it's not always in our direct control. Okay, any other questions? I think we did talk a lot about this kind of thing in the first item, so um, that, that might be why. One of the things that um, I was kind of thinking about as the panel more widely is because you've got these kind of proposed measures um, on page 22 and how we might, I know some of the other panels have sort of metrics that they bring back every year so that as a panel we can look at year on year how things have changed. So maybe some of the ones that are kind of November release dates we could sort of bring back on a, 
an annual basis to see how we're, well we're doing. Um, unless there was anything else you wanted to add before we finish up. Okay. Um, and then we're looking at the work program schedule. So right at the uh, page 191, um, we've got the uh, work program schedule for the meeting. Um, it's still draft, but I think most of these are pretty set. Um, in the next, we talked a little bit about the future items. So next meeting is going to be employability for young people, anti-poverty strategy and culture strategy. If there is anything in particular that you want the panel to the officers and cabinet members to be looking into around this area, any anything that you don't, any data you want us to pull out, it'd be really helpful that we can give them a steer so that you know we get the information that we want from them. So any ideas, please do pass them along. But it doesn't sound there right. are any ideas. Um, and I did note that on the 27th of March, we do only have one item. So um, maybe we can look at bringing the Anchored in Greenwich uh, evaluation to that. But if there is anything else that the panel is particularly interested in looking at that isn't on the work program at the moment, please do um, let me know. Um, but I'll send an email to ask this question again soon. Are we adding um, the, the high value business back in uh, as a discussion item after the sector study comes out? Yes, but um, I think that might be in the next year's work program. So, yeah, looking at maybe early, maybe next September, November. It, it would be good to do something like one year on and then include it within the update report potentially on the inclusive economy strategy and have a major section on the attracting high value businesses so that we don't dilute it in amongst the wide variety of things that are covered within the strategy. So it just be a longer report. Is that okay? Okay, so that's gonna come back to the April 2025 meeting um, and will be kind of a big section of the one year review on the, econo uh, the inclusive economy strategy. Does that sound right? Anything else? Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much uh, for everyone attending tonight and have a good rest of your evenings.